Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the USMLE guys. My name is Dr. Paul. Today's video features another sample video from our high yield USMLE step one crash course. The topic of today's video is the basics of bacteriology. If you enjoy this video and you find it to be useful, all I ask is that you hit that thumbs up button below, share it with your friends. And if you're not yet subscribed, make sure you hit that subscribe button and set up notifications. And I will let you know every time we release a brand new video, just like this. Let's not waste any more time. Let's dive into today's lesson. All right, everybody, welcome to micro. Now, I know this isn't most people's favorite topic, but there's some important information that we absolutely must know in order to ensure that we're putting ourselves in a good position and the best position possible to be able to master and in, in, in identify the highest yield information on exam day. So we're not going to go through every single micro detail that you learned in med school. We're going to focus on the hard hitting high yield facts that you absolutely need to know because they're most likely to pop up on exam day. So let's just dive in with question number one. Go ahead and hit that pause button and come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer is D. So you know the basic structure of a bacterium. This is stuff you learned in undergrad, so I don't want to waste time and spend any time on that. The most efficient way to review this is to know what structures a bacteria has to help it survive and thrive, as well as specific structures unique to the gram positive and the gram negative organisms. So let's look at the basic structure of the bacteria and then talk about the unique features we need to know. So characteristic to both gram positive and gram negative, we have flagellum the pilus, the capsule, the cytoplasmic membrane. Now the flagellum, what does this do? It aids in motility. The pilus helps the bacteria to adhere to a cell surface. And then we have something known as the sex pilots. That's of course required for bacterial sex. The capsule is a peptidoglycan layer and that helps in protecting the bacteria against phagocytosis. It gives, it, it gives the bacteria support and also provides protection against osmotic pressure damages. Now remember, that in gram-positive bacteria, it is thicker, while in gram-negative bacteria, it is very thin. I'm talking about the, the peptidoglycan capsule or layer. The cytoplasmic membrane is a phospholipid bilayer with proteins embedded. Now, this is where enzyme transport will occur. Now, like I said, we need to know specifics to bacteria that are gram-positive and negative. So gram-positive bacteria, the big important thing that's unique to them is the lipotechoic acid and the tecoic acid. Now, lipotechoic acids are anchored to the cell's membrane via glycolipids, while tecoic acids are covalently bound to the cell wall peptidoglycan. Now, le uh, uh, the lipotechoic acids, they can actually induce a couple things that are very important for us to know. Tumor necrosis factor alpha and IL-1, interleukin-1. Now, unique to gram-negative bacteria, we have the endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide. This is found in the outer leaflet. And endotoxin lipid A induces tumor necrosis factor as well as interleukin-1. Porins, these are necessary for transportation across the outer membrane. And then we have the periplasm. Now this is a space that's located between the cytoplasmic membrane and the outer membrane, and it has a role in accumulating components exiting the gram-negative bacterial cells. All right, let us move on to the next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you have the right answer. The correct answer here is C. Okay, now before we dive in and we talk about Staph aureus, I want to show you the algorithm chart you absolutely positively must know before your step one exam. So you can find this chart in your first aid. It's, it's more um, complete to one picture, or you can take a snapshot of this and then the next page. But whatever you use, please make sure you know everything on these algorithms for both gram positive and gram negative bugs. As well, when we dive into viruses, you can do the same thing. This is the highest yield of the high yield stuff. And if you know these charts alone, it will help keep all of the really high yield important information um, organized in your head. It's easier to think in flow chart terms than to try and memorize a bunch of random things. Okay. Now, as we move forward, we're going to focus on following the details associated with the bugs in these algorithms. Okay. Now, let's go back and discuss the answer uh, to this question. So. Coming back to Staph aureus here, you need to make sure you know all the features such as that it's catalase and coagulase positive and that it's a cocci found in clusters. 
just remember staff, a staff of people gathers just like the, the staff uh, organisms gather. Now, the most common location you'll find staph aureus is in the nares, in the ears, in the axilla, and in the groin. It has a virulence factor that is known as protein A. And this protein A binds the FC IgG and it inhibits phagocytosis and complement activation. Now, what can happen as a result of a staph aureus infection? Well, we've got inflammatory diseases and we've got toxin-mediated diseases. The inflammatory-mediated diseases can lead to things like skin infections, um, organ abscesses as a result of coagulase and toxins that form fibrin clots and lead to abscess formation. We can see pneumonia, specifically after an influenza virus infection. We can see endocarditis, osteomyelitis, as well as septic arthritis. Now the toxin-mediated uh, conditions are very, very high yield. We have toxic shock syndrome, um, staph scalded skin syndrome, and food poisoning, of course. Now toxic shock syndrome is very commonly tested, and you want to know the pathology here. And ultimately what's going on is it leads to the formation of a superantigen that binds to MHC2 and T-cell receptors. This results in poly polyclonal T-cell activation and cytokine release. And what that's going to cause is things like fever vomiting, desquamation, a rash, it can lead to shock, it can even lead to organ failure. Now the common scenario is prolonged use of uh, vaginal tampons or nasal packing. So always be on the lookout for those two things, associate them with toxic shock, toxic shock syndrome. Next we have food poisoning. Now when it comes to food poisoning linked to Staph aureus, this is usually due to the ingestion of heat stable enterotoxins and that's usually the result of simply insufficient cooking. Now this is characterized by non-bloody diarrhea and vomiting, and time frames are important when it comes to food poisoning. You need to know that this um, food poisoning with Staph aureus happens two to six hours after ingestion. So you really wanna keep that in mind. It happens really quickly. So consider the situation, you go out to eat at a restaurant, a couple hours later you feel sick, you're throwing up, you've got non-bloody diarrhea. Think Staph aureus, okay? And the last thing is the Staph scalded skin syndrome. This occurs due to exfoliative toxin A, and that gets released and it causes a loss of cell adhesion in the epidermis. This, of course, leads to the formation of blisters. All right, well, let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is E. So what's the bacteria we're talking about here? If you said Staph epidermidis, excellent job, you're right. So of course, Staph epidermidis is catalase positive, coagulase negative, it's also urease positive. Now, it is a coxide that groups into clusters, and it is also novobiosin sensitive, and it does not ferment mannitol. And this is an important differentiator from Staph aureus, which does ferment mannitol. Now, one of the important clinical nuggets that you want to remember about this bug is that it is known to infect prosthetic devices like heart valves or other implanted devices. It can also grow well on IV catheters, so keep that in mind too, okay? So think about prosthetic devices, things that are implanted when we uh, see infections. Think staph epidermidis. All right, let's move on to our next question. Hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. Correct answer here is D. What are we dealing with here, guys? This is Staph saprophyticus. But what are the unique characteristics that we need to know? First, it is catalase positive. It is coagulase negative. It is urease positive, And it is a coccyx-shaped bug found in clusters. So if you get these physical characteristics, please make sure you recognize this. This is also novobiosin resistant. And make sure you realize and understand and remember that it is also normal flora in the female genital tract and in the perineum. A common question you get with this bug is that it is the second most common cause of uncomplicated UTIs in younger females. Do you know what the most common cause of an uncomplicated UTI is? It is E. coli. That's gram negative, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. Correct answer here is C, strep pneumonia. So strep pneumonia is gram positive, 
alpha hemolytic, and it is a lancet-shaped diplococcus. It is encapsulated, and that is what gives it its virulence. It is also optogen-sensitive and bile-soluble. It also has an IgA protease. Now, some important facts you want to keep in mind with regards to strep pneumonia is that it is associated with rust-colored sputum and is a common cause of sinusitis, meningitis, pneumonia, and in children, otitis media. Okay, if you see this in a sickle cell patient, what can it cause? It can cause sepsis. Very important to keep that one in mind. All right, let us move on to the next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is E, strep sanguinis. Now, this belongs to the Viridans group Streptococci, which also includes uh, strep mitis and strep mutans. These are gram-positive alpha hemolytic cocci that are also optogen resistant and bile insoluble. Now, they are normal flora where? They're normal flora of the oral pharynx, and that's okay. But if they get out of hand, they can lead to problems specifically in this region. Strep sanguinis can aggregate on damaged heart valves. This can lead to subacute bacterial endocarditis. And this occurs because they make dextrins that bind to the fibrin platelet aggregates on those valves. Now, strep mutans and mitis can both lead to dental caries, which of course means tooth decay. So make sure you keep that in mind. That's, that's fairly high yield and common as well. All right, let's move on to the next question. All right, go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. correct answer here is strep pyogenes A. So this is of course identifiable by the presence of anti-DNAs B antibodies as well as an ASO titer. So if you see these, it's indicative of a recent strep pyogenes infection. So what is strep pyogenes structurally? Of course, gram positive. It's a cocci and it's found in chains. It is bacitracin sensitive, it is beta hemolytic, and it is PYR positive. It also has the ability to inhibit phagocytosis, and it does this via its hyaluronic acid capsule and its M protein. There are three types of issues that we need to recognize here. We have the uh, pyogenic, toxigenic, and immunologic. So pyogenic, this can lead to pharyngitis. It can lead to impetigocellulitis and or erysipelas. Now, keep something very important in mind here, that pharyngitis can cause rheumatic fever and glomerulonephritis, whereas strains that cause impetigo simply cause glomerulonephritis. The toxigenic type can lead to scarlet fever, toxic shock syndrome, and necrotizing fasciitis. Now in scarlet fever, there's a few uh, unique characteristics you wanna keep in mind. We see blanching of the skin, a body rash, a strawberry tongue, as well as circumoral pallor, and these are all in the setting of a group A strep pharyngitis. Now immunologically, this can lead to rheumatic fever and glomerulonephritis. Okay, keep all that in mind, very high yield stuff. All right, let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. Correct answer here is A. So strep agalactia is a cocci shaped bacitracin resistant beta hemolytic bacteria that colonizes the vagina. And it can lead to pneumonia, meningitis, and probably the most high yield thing you want to pull from this is that it can cause neonatal sepsis. For this reason, we swabbed the vagina and the rectum at 35 to 37 weeks gestation, and if found, we will give intrapartum penicillin as prophylaxis. If you're asked about testing relating to this bacteria, remember, it is hippurate test positive and PYR negative. Now, just as a side note, the hippurate hydrolysis test means that we're looking at the bacteria's ability to hydrolyze hippurate into both benzoic acid and glycine, and this happens via the action of of the hepuricase enzyme, and that is found, of course, within the bacteria. Okay, let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is E. So strep bovis is a non-enterococcus gram-positive gamma hemolytic PYR negative bacteria that can grow in bile. It is, of course, cocci shaped and it is catalase negative. Now, uh, Strep gallolyticus, which is Strep bovis biotype 1, 
can lead to bacteremia and subacute endocarditis. And it's also associated with, and this is high yield, I'm flashing something in front of you so you remember, it's associated with colon cancer. Now the infective endocarditis that's linked to this organism tends to cause the formation of large vegetations and it is known to be highly destructive. This leads to perforation of the valve and invasive disease with cardiac septal or valvular ring abscess formation. Now just as a side note, there are different biotypes of strep bovis. The most important one that you need to know for your exam here is going to be the strep bovis biotype 1, which is of course strep gallolyticus. All right, let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is B. The enterococci bacteria include Enterococcus faecalis and Enterococcus faecium. Now, these are normal flora of what? They're normal flora of the colon, and they can cause biliary tract infections, subacute endocarditis, as well as UTIs. Now, typically, you want to be on the lookout for these as a cause of any of these conditions after a patient has undergone some sort of GI or GU procedure. These are penicillin G resistant and some can even be vancomycin resistant, which makes them likely to cause nosocomial infections. When you look at that algorithm chart that I mentioned a few minutes ago, what you'll notice is that one of the tests we run in strep species undergoing gamma, meaning no hemolysis, is whether they can grow in 6.5% sodium chloride. Now, when you compare the enterococcus species to the strep bovis species, we can see that enterococcus species can grow in that harsher environment which means they're going to be more resilient organisms than their strep counterparts. Let's end this lecture with four true-false questions testing your knowledge of the bacillus species. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to go ahead and try and figure out if this is true or false. Is this true or false? This is actually false. So first, Bacillus anthracis is a gram-positive spore-forming rod that produces what? The anthrax toxin. This is an exotoxin consisting of a protective antigen, a lethal factor, and an edema factor. It also has a polypeptide capsule that's made of polydeglutamic acid. On microscopy, I want you to keep in mind that you need to be looking for colonies that have a halo of projections appearance. This is also often referred to as having a medusa head appearance. That's sort of a buzzword. They're not going to tell you that. They'll probably describe it. Now, cutaneous anthrax is characterized by the presence of a painless papule that's surrounded by vesicles, moving into a painless and necrotic black ulcer. On rare occasion, it can cause bacteremia and death, but the cutaneous anthrax uh, type is not necessarily going to lead down that road. Pulmonary anthrax is caused by the inhalation of spores, and that usually comes from contaminated animals or contaminated animal products. Now, this disease is characterized by the presence of flu-like symptoms that rapidly turns into a fever, pulmonary hemorrhage, mediastinitis, and even shock. Now, on chest x-ray, what you'll see with mediastinitis is a widening of the mediastinum. And they may also refer to pulmonary anthrax as wool sorter's disease. All right, let's go on to our next true-false question. Give you a few seconds. Go ahead and figure this one out. You think this is true or false? This is false. So Bacillus cereus is a gram-positive rod-shaped bacteria. This is a very common cause of food poisoning and very highly tested cause. Now there's two types that we want to be on, be on the lookout for. The emetic type, this leads to nausea and vomiting within one to five hours after ingestion. And we also have the diarrheal type, and that causes watery but non-bloody diarrhea along with abdominal pain. And this is within approximately eight to 18 hours. So emetic type, one to five hours, the diarrheal type within eight to 18 hours. Don't forget Staph aureus also happens fairly quickly within two to six hours. So you wanna make sure you consider the time frames and the possible bacterial cause. Now, the reason why this causes food poisoning is because spores found within the food, which is classically rice, don't get destroyed during the cooking process. Then when we keep the rice warm, those spores germinate and we form an enterotoxin. Okay, keep in mind that we can't treat this with an antibiotic because it won't work against that toxin. So all we do is treat supportively. So make sure we replenish fluids and, and then just treat any symptoms as they come. All right, let's move on to our next question. True or false, go. This is true. 
Remember, the diarrheal type leads to a non-bloody, watery diarrhea, as well as abdominal pain, approximately 8 to 18 hours after ingestion. I just mentioned this on the last question, so hopefully you got that one right. Let's do our last true-false question to end this lecture. Is this true or false? Go. Is this true or false? This is false. So colonies of uh, Bacillus anthracis will demonstrate that Medusa head, which is those halo of projections appearance. This question asked you about Bacillus serious. The correct answer is actually Bacillus anthracis. All right, that is the end of this lecture. We'll see you on the next lecture. That's it for today's video. I hope you found that to be helpful. If you did and you want to learn more about the full 35-hour high-yield USMLE Step 1 crash course that we offer, make sure you visit the link in the description below. And if you found this to be helpful, all I ask is that you hit that thumbs up button below. And again, if you're not yet subscribed, hit that subscribe button, set up notifications, and I will let you know every time we release a brand new video. Appreciate you guys sticking around until the end. I appreciate you for being here. I'll see you on the next episode.